All right, let's go ahead and take our Bible and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're just going to get right in. We'll get right into the lesson um, today. All right, so today we're going to talk about getting the most of uh, most from worship, getting the most from worship. Let's read verses 1 through 7. Let's do it responsibly. I'll read one, you read one. We'll go, only, only seven verses here, so let's do that uh, this morning, all right? All right, it says, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Verse 2. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. When thou vowest to vow to God, determine not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Thou hast heard the words of fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Therefore should God be angry at thy voice, and destroy the work of thy hands. Verse 7, For in the multitude of dreams, in many words, there are also divers vanities. But fear thou God. All right, so there we're going to talk about getting the most from worship. He had a good point here in his uh, introduction. He, he was talking about how most people... Don't get, uh, don't see the worship services as being meaningful to them. Most people don't get much out of them. Most people don't believe they're meaningful to them. And here's the reason he says he says because you can tell by what they attend. Isn't that true? What's important to you, what you get the most out of, is what you attend. Uh, you know, and, and we can look at people's lives and see what they get the most out of. Um, by what they attend. Like uh, on a Sunday morning, what are they going to? Are they going to church? Are they going to Sunday school? Uh, are they there? They're not getting the most out of it. And a lot of times we blame that um, on the pastor or on the, the Sunday school teacher. And, and, and there's a lot of blame to go here. I understand that. <laughs> but there could be much better. <laughs> but but there's there, a lot of times that's what we do. Uh, but what we need to do is we need to examine ourselves and see why am I not getting the most out of this that I could. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at uh, what we can do, requirements for getting the most um, out of worship. So the first thing we're going to do, and this is an important one, we're going to talk about before worship, all right? So before worship. Look at verse number one. It says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. So keep thy foot. That word, keep thy foot, it's talking about before we go. Uh, giving my, Barnes said like this, he said, give thy mind to what thou art going to do. Uh, to keep your foot, to, to realize the steps that you're going to take. Watch your step. And so the idea here is to be prepared. Don't come uh, dull-minded. Don't come unprepared uh, to worship God. Don't come insensitive uh, to God. We ought to come with a heart that is prepared to worship God. Uh, who's got John? I'm going to need some help with this, so y'all help me, all right? Who can get John 4.23? Who's got John 4.23? But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. So God is seeking people to worship him, and he seeks people to worship him in spirit uh, and in truth. Um, I like, now read that again, Brother and brother, This is something I've not noticed before in this verse, really. What does it say there? And, and read the first part of it. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So what is it that God is seeking? What is it that he's looking for? What does it say he's looking for in that verse? Worshippers. Not just worshippers. That's the way I always looked at it. True worshippers. True worshippers. <laughs> you know, we ought to come as true worshippers. That's what God wants. He wants some true worshippers. And, and it says in there that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. Um, when we come to church, I think a lot of times we spend so much time preparing our outside. You know, uh, and I'm for it. Please don't come in your pajamas. <laughs> don't come not taking a bath. Brush your teeth, please. I'm for all of those things. But that's what we worry about, right? Um, oh, man, we're taping this, so I probably shouldn't say it. But, like, Rebecca, when I come home, 
on Sunday afternoon. Like after church, I come home, and like I leave home, and everything's pretty good, and they're like, I come home, there are outfits everywhere. There's four or five laid out on the bed. There's there's hangers here and there. And I'm like, what happened? You know, I was like, well, I couldn't figure out what outfit to wear. She spent an hour getting ready and, and changed. No, I don't like that one. You know. Um, <laughs> And I, and I I love it. You know, my wife comes. She looks beautiful. and She's prepared and, and coming ready. But but here's my question. How many of us are concerned with our hearts coming to worship? How many of us are concerned with our spirit? That's what it says there. We, we should come in spirit uh, and in truth. So when we come, we need to come uh, prepared to worship. It says in spirit and in truth. We ought to come with a genuineness, a sincerity, not a hypocrisy. Uh, this is the way we should come to worship. And so three sort of tips, three ways that we can prepare ourselves uh, before we come uh, to worship. I think this is so important. All right. Number one, I guess that's letter A. Um, saturate the week in prayer. We ought to be praying every day, um, being pre getting prepared to come to hear, to worship uh, God. Um, what is the truth from John 16, 24 that we can learn uh, from that. Who, who's got John 16, 24 for us? All right. Uh, Brother Robert, read that, please. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. So how many have come asking God, uh, praying, asking God that, that, to have a time of worship with him? I want to come and I want to hear from God today. I want, I want, I want to come and I'm, I'm, I'm coming, I'm praying, I'm asking God that he would, he would speak to me. You know, how can we pray for our services? We can pray, uh, first of all, for us, right, that we're, that we're ready. Uh, we can pray for our pastor. I, I want to ask you this. I don't want you to raise your hand, but how many of you have prayed for your pastor this week in, in prepared, preparation for the worship service? Uh, our pastor's had a busy week. He's been, he's, been, he's been in a marriage retreat. We've had to be making these decisions and all these things that are going on. You know, should we meet? Should we not? Should we do this? Should we do that? Should we have but? Should we do this? You know, it's been stressful. Uh, he traveled uh, six hours and then back. And but how many of you have, have have really spoken his name in prayer this week? Have you have you prayed for him? We ought to be praying. Hey, we ought to pray that God would bring people to the worship service. Hey, I mean, how many of you have lost family and friends that you would like to see at, at, at church? Have you prayed for that this week? Have you prayed for it? You know, it says, ask and you shall receive and have joy, right? And so we ought to be praying, uh, saturating the week with prayer uh, for this worship, for worship service. Um, all right, number two, anticipate a great worship service. So we should anticipate. We should come with expecting God to do great things. Um, let me show you something. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 8 with me. Luke chapter 8. This is our Bible reading for the week. How many of you are trying to read through the Bible with those little bookmark things that we, we gave out? Anybody trying to do that? Am I the only one? Okay, good. I, I, want, I want to feel like that's being used, you know. It's useful. It's like, well, there's trouble and people don't even use them. But anyway. Uh, so some of y'all doing that, right? So this week has been Luke chapter 8. Notice what happened here in Luke chapter 8. What does Jesus respond to, all right? Um, so they're out on the water in verses 22, 23, 24, and, and, and they come to him, and what does he say? He said, they said, don't you care that we perish? Look at verse 25. And he said to them, where is your, what does it say? Faith. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Look at verse number 48. Turn over to Luke 8, 48. So the lady comes to Jesus, and she's sick, right? The sick lady comes to him and touches his garment. And what does he turn and say to her? Look at verse number 48. He says, daughter, be of good comfort. What does it say? Thy faith hath made thee whole. Um, so they come to Jesus and they tell him that daughter's dead, right? That, that he was going to, to heal that daughter of Jairus. I think it's Jairus. He's going to heal the daughter. And, and they come to him and they say, don't trouble him. And look at verse 50. What does he say? He says, fear not. What does it say? Believe only. You know, a lot of times I think we come and we're not believing. Uh, in verse four, chapter 9, verse 41, he, he was talking to the, the disciples. The disciples didn't, didn't get to heal that young man that, they, that, 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 that Jesus came and healed. And he looked at him and he says, oh, faithless generation. He, he calls them faithless. You know, why is it you don't receive the things uh, during worship that you should? Why do you not get the most out of worship that you should? I think a lot of times we come not anticipating with no faith. We don't believe God's going to do anything. So you know what? God doesn't. 
We need to come believing that God is going to do something in our worship services. We don't need to come every week just, oh, here we are again, another Sunday school lesson. Oh, here we are again. Perhaps we're going to preach for 30 minutes or 45. Uh, here we are again, you know. Um, so choir will get up and sing. And, you know, it's the same old song. I heard that one last week. You know, they, they did that one a month ago, I think. We need to come anticipating with faith that God is going to speak um, to us. Uh, so what verse, what, what do we know is going to happen when two or three are gathered? Who's got that verse? Somebody read it. All right, Steph, please. And Matthew 18, 20. And where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He will be there. <laughs> and that's powerful, right? We ought to anticipate uh, God doing something. All right, number three here. So number three is cultivate your heart. Cultivate your heart. Uh, in, in Luke 8, where we just were, Jesus gives the parable of the sower and the seed, right? And he gives the different types of ground. And, and we ought to have come with a cultivated heart. Uh, you know, if, if you go out and you, you have unprepared ground, you throw out seed, what are the chances really of grass growing there? It's hard. Now, right now, you can't find hard ground. Uh, but if, if it, it's hard, um, you know, like that... Like that, that uh, uh, that concrete out there and you throw out seed, you're not expecting to get much out of that. Why? Because it's not cultivated. It's not ready for the seed. And we need to cultivate our hearts. We need to come with our hearts prepared to take in the seed. Um, who's got uh, Psalm 19, uh, 14? All right, read that for us, please. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and redeemer. When we come, we ought to come with our hearts pre prepared. We ought to meditate. Uh, right outside that Psalm 1, 2, and 3. Psalm 1, 2, and 3. I think those verses go right along with this. We ought to come with a cultivated heart. He, he's talking about that man that's going to be blessed of the Lord. It says that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. That is cultivating the ground. And then what does it say about him? It says that he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. It's talking about how your fruit is going to, you, you'll have fruit, your, your leaf won't wither. You'll be prosperous because you are prepared to receive the word of God. So I ought to come with a cultivated heart. What are some ways, real quickly, y'all just give them to me, uh, some ways that we can cultivate our heart during the week. What are some ways we can cultivate our heart to be prepared for worship? Just where you, you okay, pray, right? Pray, okay, that's an obvious one that we just talked about, right? So we're just talking about it. Pray, but do we do that? Do we prepare our hearts? Is that the way we cultivate our hearts? What's another way? Cultivating your heart. Anybody? I, I mean, I think I think Bible reading. These are simple, and we're like, oh no duh. But yeah, these are these are no duh. We should be doing them, right? Bible reading. What does the Bible compare to? The Bible is uh, compared to water, right? It's compared to water. And so, what is it we need? We need, our, we need our, our hearts to be softened. Some of us have hard hearts. And the Bible will prepare us so that you're not going to get much out of ground if it has a bunch of weeds in it either, are you? So we need to get some sin out of our life. I think that's, that's an important. We need to weed it. So, cultivate. All right, let's go ahead and get, get through some more of this. Um, next point here, number two, during worship. During worship. So he gives us some things. So now notice he says, keep that foot. When thou goest to the house of God, be more ready to hear. Be more ready to hear than to give sacrifice of fools, for they consider not what they do. So the first thing here is be attentive. So during worship, how can we get the most out of worship? Four things we should do. Be attentive. Be ready to hear. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You can write that out to the side there. Hebrews 4, 12 talks about being ready, uh, be, that the word of God is like a, a, a sword, and it discerns, it goes to the heart of, uh, of things. Uh, so we ought to be ready to hear more than to give the sacrifice of fools. We ought to come ready to hear from God. A lot of people come, as the, it says, with the sacrifice of, fool, of fools and consider not um, that they do evil. Um, so we ought to come ready to hear from God, personally ready to hear from God. Have you ever heard a message? And you thought, that would be really good for, <laughs> I'm horrible about that. You know, man, I wish that person would come. They need it. <laughs> you know, I want you to come saying, God, you know who needs this? I need this. Uh, and so we ought to come attentive, ready for God to speak to you. Here's what I have no doubt of. I have no doubt that God is going to speak this morning. We are reading his word. Uh, our pastor always preaches his word. We sing songs that are, are rich in Scripture and in the Word, 
And there's no doubt. But here's the question. How many of us are going to hear it? That's the question, right? How many of us are really going to listen to what God has? So be attentive. Be attentive. Consider, uh, don't, don't consider this for somebody else. Consider this to be for you. So be attentive. Uh, number two here, letter B. Be reverent. Notice the next verse. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we let our words be few sometimes? Um, but notice what he says. He says that God is in heaven. Uh, there's a big difference between you and God. And when we come to worship him, we need to realize that. That doesn't mean that God doesn't want to have a relationship with you, a personal relationship with you. It doesn't mean that God is far off and that you cannot touch him. God loved you so much and wanted to have such a relationship with you. He sent his son Jesus on earth uh, to die for our sins and, and to walk amongst men. And so it, it's not that God wants to be uh, far from you, but we need to remember who God is. We still need to remember who God is. Who's got Isaiah 40, verse 28? All right, Abby, would you please read that for us? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Did you hear, I see that? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard? Hey, don't you know this? God is God. God is God. He's the creator. He's the one that's made it all. And when we come, we ought to come reverently ready to worship the God of heaven. How many of you know if you're going to the governor's house today? I don't know if you, maybe you don't like the governor. But anyway, we're not trying to get political here. But just you're going to the governor's house today, that you would you dress up a little bit. You'd, you, you'd realize this is an important guy, this is an important dude I'm going to, going to eat lunch with today. And it would be a little different than going uh, just home, right? I mean, it's going to be different, right? You're going to, you're going to spit. White House. You're going, you're going to eat with the president of the United States. I mean, like him or don't like him, most powerful man in the world, you know? <laughs> Um, it's going to be different. But what did it say in verse number one? Where are we going? It says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. It should be more, more important. We should, show, we should realize this is a more important meeting than meeting with the governor or meeting with the president. This is meeting with the God of heaven. And so when we go, we ought to be reverent. Um, that is one thing about the, the, the modern Christian movement is they're really... Uh, trying to take away from the reverence of God in that. Uh, the way that the, 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 the music, the dress, I mean, it's like going to, it, it really is, in some instances, it, it, it boils down almost like you're going to a nightclub. Or, and, and there ought to be some reverence shown uh, in our worship. Um, it doesn't mean it needs to be dead. I don't believe in dead. It's, it said in spirit and in truth, right? We, we ought to, we, it should be dead. It should be dry or dull. It should be something that we did, don't like. It ought to be more... We should, we should enjoy it, right? I mean, we should, uh, because this is the God, this is the God of heaven that wants to speak to you, that wants to have worship from you, that, that desires that. He desires that true worship. So we got to be reverent. We got to be reverent. Um, I believe that we ought to do our best to look good and, and dress nice. And I believe we ought to come and be respectful. We ought to respect the word of God. We ought to respect the house of God. I believe we ought to do our best to respect it. Um, I don't want to get into this. I don't want to go down this path too much, but it does bother me the way, the way some people treat their Bibles, the way some people treat um, the house of God. And, and, and we ought to show respect and reverence uh, to those things. We need to remember who God is. Um, so, number or letter C. All right. So, letter C. So, be reverent. Be focused. Be focused. All right. Look at verse number three. And I'm gonna be honest with you here. Okay. I don't completely understand this verse. All right. Um, can I say that and be get away with it? I've tried to study it and still still don't know that I know it. It says, "For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words." So we're talking about being focused, not being not being distracted, not being uh, pulled aside. Now he said, and this is the, this is the what I I thought this was pretty good. He said that the word "dream" there, a multitude of dreams. He says the word "dream" it refers to daydreaming or and he it, mental doodling. 
I thought that was a neat definition uh, that he gave there of dream, like daydreaming. How do you feel like you mental doodle all the time? <laughs> like my mind is mental doodling right now, I think. You know, I don't know. <laughs> After he said that, I was like, that's a neat definition. <laughs> But it's mental doodling. And so he's saying don't be distracted by a bunch of words. Don't be distracted by daydreaming. Um, we have so much going on in our minds, in our lives. It is so easy uh, to be distracted. And even during times of worship. You know, you're sitting in there in the service. It starts getting 12 o'clock. Your belly starts growling a little bit. What do you start thinking about? I mean, Dad's up there preaching his guts out, and we're thinking, I wonder what restaurant I'm going to go to. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what I'm going to eat after, sir. And next thing you know, he's preaching out of Joshua, and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're at McDonald's. and nobody's going to be at McDonald's. But you're, you're at whatever place you're Why? Because we're not focused. Uh, like you're thinking about, you know, this week I've got so much to do. It's, it's Sunday, and it's supposed to be focusing on the Lord. But, man, I've got this, this, and this, and this. And I've got to do this. And what am I going to do? Hey, my child's at home now till April 6th. What am I going to do? You know, I mean, it's just like. But what should we do? We should be focused on what the Lord has for us in that service. Can I say something? I'm going to say it, and y'all y'all don't have to listen to me. Um, cell phones are killing our worship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Parents. I'm going to say this, and I really believe this. You need to take them away during worship service. I, take them away. You need, they do not need to possess them. They cannot handle it. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm just, I know that's blunt, and, and you do what you're the parent. I am not. I've, I've observed. Ooh. They can't handle it. Uh, take it away. They'll be okay for an hour Amen. and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, I made it through high school, never had a, had a cell phone, and, and, and emergencies happen, and I get that. They don't. If it happens there, you're there. You, they don't need it. Uh, take them away. It, it, it keeps us from being focused. Um, I do on Wednesday nights, and I try to make it a positive thing. It, it probably hasn't been. But I try to make it a positive thing. We're doing this for you. <laughs> this is to help you. <laughs> you know, they don't believe me. Um, <laughs> but but it, 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 our focus, man, we need to stay focused on what the Lord has for us. If we're going to worship Him, I like this verse, Psalm forty six ten. Somebody read that for us, and let's let's all let's all take a moment and, and, and focus on this verse. All right, read that for us, Armin. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, and we will be exalted in the earth. Let's notice that first part. Let's focus in on that first part. Okay. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. When we come to our worship service. Um, can we just do that for a little bit? When we come to our Sunday school class, can we do that for a minute? Can we be still and know that he is God? Can we focus in on worshiping the God of heaven? Can I tell you another pet peeve while we're on pet peeves? Um, <laughs> that's the reason I encourage people to keep their Bibles open and follow along. Uh, I, I've said this, and I, I don't know that it's completely true, but I, I, I believe it to be partially true. Um, a closed Bible is a closed heart. Whenever I see a person and they're listening to me preach and they close their Bible, they're done. <laughs> it's just like, okay, well, you can go home. Uh, but keep your Bible open. Follow along. I had one kid on Wednesday. Uh, we were doing our lesson, you know, and, and he had closed his Bible. It was all boys so for some reason. It was the weirdest thing Wednesday night. But it was mostly boys, but so it was one of the kids. One of the boys. I don't know if he had, but teenage boys. He had closed the Bible. And I told him, I'm going to everybody turn over to that. And I could tell that's going to be a lot of effort for him. He didn't want to do it. And so, so I stopped. I said, look, open your Bible. Just open it anywhere. It'll make me feel better. Just open it, all right? And we were somewhere in the New Testament. He was way in the Old Testament. But I was like, that's okay. You know? but, but it helps us to stay focused. When we follow along with the preacher, whenever I do children's church, I have them put their finger on the page. Half of them can't read. But I want them to have their finger on the page and follow along. Why? Because I want us to focus. On what the Lord has for us. So focus. Uh, let's move on. Let's do this quick. Don't delay your commitments. Don't delay your commitments. Look at verse number four. He says, When thou vowest a vow uh, unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. I have that underlined in my Bible. Some people, I believe, think God takes pleasure in foolishness. I mean, that's just, he says he takes no pleasure in fools. You know, I'm going to tell you something. When you're doing foolish things, God doesn't, that, that does not please God. God takes no pleasure in your foolishness. So, totally side note, I'm not focused on that, I guess. 
But when thou foust about unto God, it says, defer not to pay it. That word defer means don't delay it. Don't delay in fulfilling your vows. Here's what I want you to put beside it, because we did be, be attentive, be reverent, be focused. Put be responsive. Be responsive. Respond to the word of God. Hey, listen, when God speaks to you, respond. I don't believe that every time the, 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 the preacher preaches, you have to go down to the altar. I, I believe you can make commitments from your pew. I'm, I'm, I do believe that. But it's a good thing to respond to the Word of God. And it won't hurt you to go down to the altar and pray, to make a commitment to God. Be responsive. Don't delay in it. When God speaks to you, respond. How do you know it's, it, it, is a, it is a blessing of God when God speaks to you? That is a gift. Do you understand that? That is a gift. When God says something to you from his word, you ought to be grateful and thankful, and you ought to respond to that. What if God just allows you to go in the way that you're going? He gives you no conviction. He, he shows you nothing new from his word. What is the ends of the ways of man? The Bible says it's death. It's destruction. That's, that's the path that you're on. But when God speaks to you, he's saying, hey, don't go that way. And what should we do? We should respond. Don't delay in responding um, to God. What happens when you delay things? Y'all know this. What happens when you say, I'll do it tomorrow? It never gets done. It's not done tomorrow. What happens when you say, well, maybe next week? Yeah, yeah. What happens when you say, maybe next month or next year? Or next, it's especially you said never, right? Yeah. And so what do we need to do? Just don't delay in responding um, to God. Um, Jesus is not only to be the Savior of our lives. That's what we often want. We all claim that, right? But what is he to be? He's to be the Lord of our lives, isn't he? He is to be the Lord and Savior of our lives. And so as Lord, we ought to obey him when he speaks to us. Uh, Psalm 116, verse 18. Who's got Psalm 116? All right, Rob. I will pay my vows to the Lord and in the presence of all his people. All right. And so that sort of brings us into our next thing, all right? I will pay my vows unto the Lord. So when God speaks to you, respond. Don't delay in it. Uh, that brings us to our next point here. Our last one um, is after worship. After worship. So what should we do after worship? Um, often we compartmentalize our lives so much uh, that it's like we go to our church and do our church thing, but that doesn't affect anything else in our lives. But that's not the way it's meant to be. Uh, so we need to realize there's some things that if we worship God, um, and th th the way that we get the most out of our worship, it it's going to affect after our worship, all right? So first, keep your commitments. It goes on, right on with what we were talking about. Notice verse number five. He says, Better is it thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Um, so it's talking about keeping um, your commitments to God. When you make that vow, when you don't delay, when you respond to God, then you need to go home and, and keep that vow that you have made, that commitment that you made. We live in a world of empty promises and shallow commitments, don't we? You see it in marriages, right? I mean, because there's so much, it's just, well, well, we'll try this thing, you know? But that's not, that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's, it, we live in a when you make that commitment and people aren't going to keep it, you see people defaulting on loans and all these kinds of things. Um, I don't want to bring politics. You see all kinds of problems. We're getting into the, the politic kind of year, right? I mean, it's, it's getting here on us. Oh, Lord help us. Uh, but then all kinds of promises and, and things, right? And so we, we live with that all around, but that shouldn't be the way it is when we make our vows to God. We should vow to keep them. What is the what is the condition we often make vows to God in? Who's got that Psalm 66, 14? All right, John, read that for us, please, sir. Which my lips have uttered and my mouth had spoken when I was in trouble. When I was in trouble, right? When I was in trouble. Uh, we, we, we make a lot of our vows to God when we, we need to manipulate him. You, you know, you sit in the jailhouse. You sit, you sit in the hospitals. <laughs> Uh, you, you see it in the in the homes that are going through uh, breaking up and all those kinds. Of, we make all kinds of vows. I'm going to do better. I'm going to I'm going to be at church. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to do this. And yet, whenever the problem goes away, what happens to the vow, the commitment? It goes away, it goes away too. <laughs> but the Bible says that we shouldn't be that way. Um, look at verse six. He says, "Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin." Uh, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hand? 
basically it's saying this there. It's saying uh, that we should realize that we shouldn't try and get out of what we, the, the, commitment we, the commitment we made to God. And that one day you're going to give account of that commitment that you made. And so we need to be careful about being uh, making commitments and not keeping them. What is it that um, if we make a vow to the Lord and we're slow to fulfill, we delay to uh, fulfill, what does Deuteronomy 23, uh, 21 tell us? When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not be slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it shall be sin in thee. It will be sin. You begin to sin. Well, all right, so that brings us to this thought. A lot of people say, well, then don't make a vow. Don't make a commitment to God. <laughs> and it says don't vow if you can't keep it, right? So I'm just not going to make any vow. Um, I can be this way. I'm, I'm horrible. I, I'm trying to do better. I'm very non-committal with things sometimes. You are that way because I like, you know, if I commit myself, then I have to do it. And that's a horrible way to be. And some people take that when it comes to God. And that's what that's what they think they take from this. Well, they, I shouldn't make a vow to God. But that's not true at all. Uh, new commitments to the Lord is the way that we grow spiritually. Uh, taking steps forward for God. When God speaks to us, he says, I want you to do this. I want you to witness that person. And you commit, I'm going to witness that person. Then you need to go witness that person because that's spiritual growth in you. Uh, that's the way that God wants you to um, to grow. Who's got Psalms uh, 76, 11? All right, Sarah, please. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. So what does it say here? Read, look at the first, read the first part of that again. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Okay, so what does it say we should do? It commands us to do there, right? Vow. It says do make a vow. Do make a commitment and keep it. Keep it. Um, here's, what I would, here's the thought I want you to get from this. When you make a vow to the Lord and you keep your vows, that is how you grow spiritually and that is how the Lord uses you. And what is this whole book about? What is Ecclesiastes about? It's about this man that couldn't find purpose and meaning in life. Everything was vanity to him. But what gives life purpose and meaning is being used by the Lord. So what should we do? We should make vows to God. We should make commitments to the Lord. We should commit to read our Bible, commit uh, to soul win. We should commit to hand out tracts. We should commit uh, to go to the mission field. Is that what God calls you to do? Don't, don't back off of these things. Vow them, but vow them and keep them. Follow through. You know, it, it blesses my heart. <laughs> it blesses my heart when people make commitments to God. I'm going to be at church this week, and they show up. Hey, it blesses my heart when somebody says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm really gonna, I'm gonna be faithful to God and faithful to church, and they're faithful to God and they're faithful to church. It blesses my heart. And you know what I think it pleases the Lord? He takes no pleasure in fools, but it pleases him when people do that. All right, last thing here. Take God seriously all week. Take God seriously all week. Look at verse number seven. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also divers vanities, but notice the end of it. But fear thou. God. You know, it's not about just going down to an altar and filling out a decision card, right? <laughs> I'm rededicating my life. And then you go home Monday, uh, go home Sunday night, wake up Monday, and you live exactly the same that you did before you made that, filled out that card, right? It's about realizing that taking God seriously. That word fear, uh, it's talking about having that respect, reverence of God, knowing that he is there all the time. That is fearing God. Um, we're going to go into some things about fear. We haven't got time for that. 2 Timothy 1.7. God's not giving us a spirit. There's a good fear and a bad fear, right? There's a good fear and a bad fear. Uh, bad fear. God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we shouldn't be fearful in, in, a, in a bad sense. And, and a lot of us are right now. There's a lot of panic going on. For reason, there's no toilet paper. I mean, there's fear, right? And, and so uh, the Bible says that we shouldn't have that bad fear. But it tells us time and time and time again that we should have a fear of God. We should have a reverence and respect for God. Realizing that God is there every day. You know, I, 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 I think that's a lot of times why we don't take our vows seriously throughout the week, right? Well, I, I'm going to live it at church. I'll go down and make a commitment. But when I go home, when I go to work, when I go to school, when I go to whatever, there's no thought of God in your heart and in your mind. But when we fear him, when we respect him, 
uh, when we realize he's always there, then it'll change the way that we live all week. So take God seriously all week. Who's got that? Proverbs 8.13. This is our last verse. All right, Abby. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. So the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. If I fear God, I will hate evil. I will live differently. I will live differently. I'll, 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 I'll realize God is there before I turn that TV to that station. I'll realize God is there before I take up that drink that I shouldn't be drinking. I'll realize God is there before I say those words to my wife or my husband that I shouldn't say. I'll fear the Lord. I realize that he is there. Uh, Psalm 34, verse 9. This is a good verse. Psalm 34, 9. It says, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. You want your best life? You know, people talk about the, your best life. I think that's a Joel Osteen thing. I don't know. Your best life. You know what your best life is? It's when you live each day in the fear of the Lord. That's your best life. Because that's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for you. All right, I hope this has helped you. Getting the most from our worship. Man, I want, I want to get more out of worship. Don't you? I want, I, want to get, I want to worship God in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for this lesson. God, I pray it's been helpful. God, I know it's helped me. Lord, it's opened my eyes to some things. Uh, Lord, I pray that even right here in this Sunday school class, uh, Lord, I pray that some of these people will make a vow to you uh, to take these things to heart, to worship you the way that they should. And Lord, as they go into the worship service this morning, I pray that they would do it changed. I pray that they would do it focused and, and realizing that God, uh, I, want, I want to have that right relationship with you. I want to give you the praise and worship you deserve. Lord, I want you to change my life uh, through this worship time with you. I pray that you'd help us with that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for being here.